let's just jump into this. Uh, let me see how does this work. So uh, this is the agenda. So there's quite a lot of uh, stuff we're going through to today. So I'll start out with sort of a big picture overview of what we're actually trying to, to solve for. Then I'll talk about MPC, the technology, and I will talk about mainnet and MPC, the token. And then talk about a little bit about what, what does it actually cost to, to use the network, the fees that you pay when you use the network, and also the uh, rewards, which is a, an additional uh, uh, payment for, for the utility that the node operators bring to the network. And I'll sum up on all of this by, some, by looking at the basic design choices that we made for, for, for the network. And then based on that, based on that knowledge about the mainnet, we can talk about the applications, what kind of new types of application can you do with this kind of uh, a network. So it's really like a 360 degree uh, introduction to, to the network. A lot of stuff, I will see if I can uh, pause uh, along the way and bring in some, some questions. Uh, so it's not going to be just a one-way communication all the way through. But otherwise, that this is going to re be recorded and you'll be able to see it afterwards uh, as well. So let's, with that, let's uh, jump in and have a look at the big picture. So, so this is, I, the idea with this one is to say that the, if you look at any economy, it really starts out with some very basic gains, which is so-called the, the so-called exchange game, which is the exchange of goods and services for money. So, so that is what you, in, this game is actually bound to fail unless you have some enforcement. So if you have a legal system, a well-functioning national state with a legal system, you have punishment there, and people would not go to these extreme outcome to keep the good and not pay for, for, for the goods. Uh, so, so, so that is uh, solved by the national states uh, within jurisdiction. When you go across jurisdiction, you might easily run into two problems. And, uh, and in any case, you can have a, the blockchain as a cryptographic enforcement of this very basic uh, problem. So of course we are solving for that as, as well as many other blockchains solve for that. But what about the, the privacy, the privacy involved in all of these uh, basic exchange games? So this is uh, involving a lot of uh, private information about our preferences and data that is used to, to match, to, to bring us to that uh, basic e exchange at the end. So this is really what the, we are focusing on, the managing of these private data in the economy. So if you take a, a broader look at this, uh, look at the digital economy uh, as, a, as a whole, you can see this as a series or a long set of uh, these exchange games. And each of them, they are different. So some of them are, are like purely market-driven uh, exchange, like with pure prices, and others are more central controlled or with instructions, or you could have any mix of these so no matter where you organize these the different trades and how the contracts they look like, you will have a problem with information. There will be an informational deficit in all of these uh, different uh, types of uh, coordination of activities in the economy. So you really need, uh, you need a solution here and uh, to, to address this uh, problem with the uh, uh, lack of information. And people realize that for, for, uh, for a very long time. And you have that the, the big uh, players in the uh, internet economy is actually trying to sort out this problem, solve, solve this problem by aggregating data and using artificial intelligence uh, to, to try to make it more efficient, these uh, ex basic exchange games. Uh, so, so if you look at the interest of like two different things here, the artificial intelligence as a tool to, to try to solve some of this and the privacy, which is the, the really about your keeping in control of your bargaining power. You can see there's, a, there's an equal interest in, around these two uh, somewhat conflicting uh, topics. And if you look at the players that actually run this, this system and have the most data, it's actually the, the governments and global, uh, global enterprises, which has the least trust uh, when, you, when you try to measure trust uh, across the, the econ economy. So, so I would say that this is actually a picture of a, a trust crisis 
And that's the, the kind of uh, trust uh, crisis that we are trying to solve by making a foundation, a new platform that can give you control of not just uh, ownership, but also data. And that is basically what this uh, web tree is all about. So it's all about bringing back the users, put the users in, behind the steering wheel and not just give them decentralized ownership, but also decentralized control and privacy uh, of data. So that's what we are solving. And that's what this platform is, is all about and making, creating an alternative for, for, for the uh, increase in digitalization, which is with Web2 is quickly moving into areas that is including even more sensitive data than, than we have today, where advertising is actually one of the biggest driver of, uh, of the internet economy. So it's, 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 a, it's very important for a number of reasons to address this uh, privacy uh, issue and control of, of data. So, so that's what we do. And, and another way to look at this is that uh, the, the blockchain is, uh, with, with the uh, traditional blockchain, is kind of replacing the coordinator in the economy. So you have this open ledger, you can agree about the true states, who is the buyers, who is the sellers, and uh, what was the outcome of a, of a deal. And uh, you can solve that basic exchange gains as I introduced, uh, talked about before. And then we are adding the, the privacy, which is actually replacing what is known as a trustee in the economy. So with these two, replacing these two sort of uh, third parties in the economy, you have basically what you need to, to re sort of uh, interpret and, and solve uh, the coordination of any activities in the economy in a, in a new way. So it is a bit of a revolution to have these tools in a ready available in a platform. And that's what the project is all about. And the team behind this has been working on this for quite some time. And the, and the tools is, base, is to bring these two types of decentralized uh, uh, cryptography solutions together. So the MPC, which is a technology that solves for privacy, and the, the blockchain, which is the, creating this decentralized uh, or, or transparent uh, ledger. Combining these two, you have basically what you need. And as, as mentioned, the team has been uh, around for some time trying to solve this problem. So even Dango is one of the co-founders has been working on this, uh, the basic result in, in theory, for actually both the, the, uh, uh, the foundation for blockchain with the hash function and also the basic results behind the multi-party uh, computation. Then uh, some of us came in and, and worked on bringing this out of university into commercial use. And, and we did the first use of this in 2008. So we were actually doing decentralized uh, DeFi solution, decentralized exchanges before Bitcoin was introduced and then we have been working on improving these technologies. And since, the, since 2017, for the past five years, we've been working on, on merging these two technologies into a unified uh, network. And that's the result uh, of a teacher blockchain is, is the result of all of this uh, work. So with that in place, uh, I will jump into talking about or introducing MPC, uh, the technology that solved for privacy. I think we will take the first round of question after this introduction of MPC. So, so this is all about privacy preserving uh, technologies. So we can have here on the, on the left, you have the, the toolbox. So traditionally you will point, appoint a trustee, talked about before, who basically is a trusted person. You give him all the data, you do all the computation and, and reveal the result or tell people what, what to do. You can also solve things with uh, certain immunization. So you're replacing identity with a certain name, or you can also categorize data with certain, certain immunization. Or you could do anonymization, which is uh, where you have tools like differential privacy, or you can cluster data in different ways. It's actually quite a difficult thing to do to really make the data anonymous, but that you can do. Or you can also do something called federated computing, where you don't uh, uh, bring data together, but you actually take the algorithm and send the algorithm to data where it exists today. And then you, then you aggregate the result of these uh, uh, functions that is run and, uh, locally. 
And then the last part is encrypted computation. That's what we're doing. So this is a sort of an, an all new security model where you start by encrypting the data and then you work directly on the encrypted data in a distributed system with no single point of trust. So the, the thing here is that with encrypted computation, you can actually go back and you can solve all of the other tools above here in a more, in a, in a better way. So you can use, you can act, you act, now you actually have a, a trusted, you can replace a trustee, for, that's the first thing. And then you can create a certain, let me say, pseudonymized data uh, without any uh, single point of trust. And you can do create anonymized data without single point of trust. And you can run federated computing in a more efficient way by coordinating the, uh, the what is known as the global uh, function in, in, in something like federated machine learning. So there's a number of ways for, for, for this to, to improve existing toolbox. So what is encrypted computation? It's really, I will come back to this in more detail, but it's really about computing directly on, on, on encrypted uh, data. So there's two ways to do this. One way is to use hardware, uh, which is known as a trusted execution environment. So this is things like the SDX uh, from, from Intel. Uh, the, the thing here is that we know for sure that this, there's a lot of security flaws with this. There's these side channels attacks. So the uh, just doing things that you encrypt, you encrypt things, send it into a, a chip and it decrypt it when it removes, when it goes out of the chip. That's not, not sufficient to, to, to keep the, uh, the privacy around the, the input data. So, and it, the, the other thing is that you have to, you basically, are, you're moving trust to the hardware producers. So those are the things that we try to solve with a software solution for, for encrypted computation. So this is, there you have a piece of software that you can uh, assess and, uh, and send to third parties and then can evaluate and see whether the, this piece of software does what it's supposed to do and people can sign off on the software. Uh, so you, it's easier to create a distributed trust ar around software. So the different, and there are different uh, protocols for, for how to, for, for software-based solution that can do encrypted computation. There's fully homomorphic encryption. It's too slow for generic use. There's uh, zero knowledge proof, which is too simple for generic use. Then there's multi-party computation, which is, which is the most efficient way and a, a Turing complete general way to compute directly on encrypted uh, data. So what we are doing is primarily multi-party computation. That's why we also call the, the token an MPC token. And, and we have been sort of the founders or the first one to, to, to bring MPC to actual commercial use as, as a team. But we also do the other types of software-based solutions. So that's why we call it a CK a computation, a zero knowledge computation. So that's what really what it is. You compute without leaking zero knowledge about the input data that you are computing on. The funny thing here is also that you can actually use these software solutions to address that well-known security flaws with hardware solutions. So it might actually be that our network in the future will have hardware modules, but working together with software solutions. Uh, but we'll see about that in, in the future. So that's an introduction to some of the methods, some of the technologies that uh, address for privacy preserving computations. So, so this is another way to look at it. You have input, keep input private, then you run the, and uh, in, in this is an illustration of the MPC, you run the computation in a distributed system. Uh, so you can go in and you can uh, look at every server in this network and you will learn nothing. At the end, you will have a result that is revealed. Uh, so, so that's kind of the, the three basic steps. But I just want to give a little bit uh, extra uh, sort of intu intuition about what MPC is all about. So here we want to share two secrets. One secret is X, and we have a distributed system. This is these three people down there uh, on the horizontal axis. So we're giving a random number to the baker down here. And uh, then we are, with that, we are drawing a line uh, between the secret and that random number. And we are delegating points to the other nodes. So, so any line could go through that random number that the baker received and any other of any of the other nodes uh, or any of the other dots or points on this line. 
So, so there's really zero information revealed about X to each of these three uh, persons. However, if just any two of these combine the information, they know everything. They know X, they, they solve the, the whole thing. So that's kind of the threshold here. So it's sometimes we call, talk about threshold cryptography. So that's kind of an example of threshold cryptography, where you, if you have sufficiently many data points from sufficiently many, many independent parties in the network, then you have the truth. So, so here we have a uh, shared X, and we could do the same with, with, uh, with Y, exactly the same way. And now we shared two, uh, two pieces, uh, two secrets. So that's part of this. That's the first part is to sharing a secret. The second part is to actually compute on these shared secrets. So in this case, I'm just going to show how you can add these numbers together, which is the, the most simple thing you can do. It's, and it's very easy to illustrate. So here we just ask each of these parties to locally add the blue dot to the red dot, and we're getting the, the black dots uh, at the end. And now with a controlled computation uh, program, we can combine uh, these dots and we have X plus Y. So here we added two secrets together without revealing anything about the, the input data. So that's an example of how MPC works in, in, a, in a distributed network and how you can compute uh, on uh, secrets. And you can compute anything. So to, to compute anything, you need to be able to do a multiplication and you need to be able to do comparisons, whether things is larger than or equal to, to some, uh, whether A is larger than B, basically. The, the thing with multiplication is that that's also just about adding things together. But you, of course, you kind of reveal how many times you do that. So it becomes a bit more complicated to, to do the computation and, and comparison built on top of multiplications. Anyway, this is what an MPC protocol does. It's kind of solving these basic operations in different ways. And they have different properties and, and depending on how they solve this. So that's also a reminder that MPC is not just one protocol, it's actually a number of protocols and we are implementing several protocols that have different advantages. So you can, if you combine them the right way, you get the most efficient uh, performance. So that, with that basic introduction of, of MPC, you can maybe take a step back and look at how, how this actually sort of changed the paradigm for how to work with data. Because now you can have two otherwise conflicting uh, objectives. You can have the decentralized control and privacy, so you remain in control of your data, and you can still have that value of combining the data, which is sort of the driver of the entire data economy. So having these two uh, simultaneously almost sounds impossible, but that's exactly what, what you do with this kind of technology, and that's why it's so revolutionary and why it has the, the potential to, to change the data economy uh, moving uh, forward. We're doing this on blockchain and blockchain is a, the ideal platform for running uh, MPC. So, so if you dive, dive into the details, there's a number of things you can do in order to optimize the way you do uh, MPC. There's, there's some pre-processing material. You can pre-prepare the computation. So when you get to the real-time computation, it runs very fast. And all of that, you can orchestrate on, on a blockchain in an easy way. And you bring in all the resources, you bring in a number, hundreds of nodes that can help you preparing all of these computations so it's so it's ready to go when you, when you need it. There is transparency, we'll come back to that. So we have this two layer, so you can have this uh, otherwise, which sounds a bit counterintuitive, but you can have this transparency about what you do and, and what kind of algorithms that you're using, and you can have privacy uh, about the input data that, you, uh, that goes into the algorithms. And this is kind of the, the, the ideal balance that people are also talking about, people that uh, try to design the new data directive in, in the European Union, as an example. They're exactly talking about this, that we need to know how data is used, but you also need to protect the individual's data. Sounds conflicting, but this is actually what you can do with this platform. Another reason is that you have this automated and robust execution so that you can orchestrate this efficient and automated orchestration of everything. And you can manage uh, that a node is failing and you can uh, reset and, and reshare the information and, and, and keep the uh, computation running. You can also improve the, uh, the 
encryption schemes by incentives. So you can build in incentives into this that is uh, strengthening the whole uh, network. And, and at the end, you have this opportunity or you have it that you can simplify the whole setup. So all of this stuff is very sort of complicated, but uh, that is sort of under the, the, under the hood and, and you can meet, you, you're just basically facing a smart contract language that allow you to, in a simple way, to point at the type of computation you want to do, whether that is a public thing or whether that is a private thing, and then execute the, uh, the smart contracts. So these are, these are very important uh, uh, advantages by using uh, a blockchain to run MPC. And this is kind of why these two technologies are bound to sort of meet and, and be merged into a unified uh, infrastructure, which we, are, which we are doing with this project. So maybe it's time, that was a bit of a uh, long start maybe. So if there's a few questions, uh, just fire them away. I'm not sure I can see the question actually, so. <laughs> yes, I see there is one question in the Q&A section from Yanni. Uh, he, she is asking what could potential Partizia hardware solution look like in the future? Ah, so, so, so Partizia is a software solution. So we are, we're building software that, that, uh, that runs a distributed system. So the hardware solution is uh, how the node is running these, uh, this uh, software. And uh, as I pointed out, there are technologies that, can, uh, that is uh, these trusted execution environment. So you could simply have that the node is running uh, a trusted execution environment. So mm -hmm. the thing with that is that uh, the, you, you create another problem. You, you need to, to, to solve the, the key management. So you, it's all about encrypting and decrypting in and out of a uh, enclave. And uh, so you need to run the uh, need a solution for the key management that you can do with the network. That's one thing. The, the other thing is that there was full of uh, security flaws with this, a side challenge attack in particular, and those you can address by combining hardware with uh, software. This is something we looked into. It's not built into the network. This is kind of a, uh, down the road, future improvement. Okay, cool. Uh, guys and girls who are watching us, if you have a question, you can either raise the hand where there are the reaction sections, so I know we can call you out. Or if your questions come on the way as Kurt is speaking, feel free to pop them in the Q&A section. Perfect. All right, uh, with that, I'm just uh, moving on and, and, and uh, give you an introduction to, to the mainnet. So this is the platform that enables all of this, uh, allow you to come in and do private and public uh, uh, computation or coordination of, of, of data in general. So uh, what we are solving for is what we call the extended trilemma. So the blockchain trilemma was all about its scalability, decentralization in a secure way. So that we're actually solving by what we call scalability. Like you can call the, 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 the layer one in all of this. Uh, then we have adding privacy, which is uh, we're using that efficient scaling, scalable layer one to, to orchestrate a zero knowledge uh, computation. So that's the privacy. And, and the third thing is the interoperability. So some networks called uh, layer zero, and then and this is actually a, a layer zero. So you have a layer one, layer two, and layer zero. So the interoperability is the, the how we uh, interact between uh, the different networks. Uh, so this is a difficult thing. I'll get back to this. This is where most of the security breaches happen when you try to move things out of these security parameters, which is a blockchain, and, uh, and move stuff across blockchain. So we're solving for all of these, uh, and we believe that uh, an efficient solution to this is a efficient infrastructure for the next generation of the internet. There's a number of innovation that, uh, that solve for all of this. I'm not going to go into all of them. I will touch on some of that. So there's some, the way we do consensus in a provable way, that's the, the way we scale with sharding, that's the way we collateralize the token bridge, that's the, the thing about the zero knowledge layer, the private and public uh, coordination of data and the smart contracts coming in. And then there's a, 
there's a what we call a trust and marketable trust that is a continuously incentivizing uh, and, and rewarding the most trusted node in, in the network. So everything becomes stronger and stronger as, uh, as the network evolves. So one of the very sort of basic design choices is a decoupled token economy. So this is about uh, not using the token that we create as a means of payment. It's, it's used for staking. So that's an opportunity to, to run a node or to delegate your tokens to someone else who's running a node. And when you run a node, you get paid, uh, not in the NPC token, but in external, well-established uh, liquid uh, tokens that is brought in through the interoperability, through the uh, token bridging. And we have this, what we call BYOC, bring your own coin. Uh, this is, we'll come back to this and see how this is uh, facilitating collaboration uh, among uh, blockchains, among particular blockchain and all the existing uh, networks out there. So we have this uh, layer one and layer two. Uh, so we have this, the efficient, robust layer one with the fast track finalization and, and all that, I'll come back to that in a bit more detail later. And then on top of that, we have the, the privacy preserving computation we have the, the bridging, we have the market for trust and so on. And, and also just uh, jurisdiction management uh, which I'll also talk about uh, a bit later that you can actually uh, delegate certain computation to a certain jurisdiction, which is also important in order to accommodate and be compliant with the uh, regulation in, in certain uh, regions. So this picture is capturing the way we use a decoupled token economy to, to have an economic alignment when we collaborate with other networks. So we bring in, you can see here at the bottom, we have a blockchain X and a blockchain Y, and then in the middle, we have the particular blockchain. So we're bringing in these established tokens that is sitting on these uh, networks. And they're used now as, as means of payment and they go into this network. And then we can bring in, we can sell back the uh, capability of the particular blockchain, uh, which could be the, the zero knowledge uh, computation as, as a service. So that's kind of the uh, collaborative exchange. And we already have that established on, on Ethereum. We have it on Polygon, we're working on Cardano and a number of other uh, blockchain uh, to, to sort of interlink the in, entire ecosystem. This is going back and talking about some of the, the basic things. So the first one is the uh, about the scalable blockchain. Next, we're talking about privacy, and then we're talking about the, the bridges. And each of these three roads have a different sort of, uh, of, each of these three things have different node roles that is solving for these problems. So here we are talking about the basic Vega nodes, the one that doing the validation of the network. So here, this is the, the basic consensus model. And here we are, we are building on top of the most uh, proven uh, method to create consensus, which is the Byzantine fault tolerance approach. So, but that is a very sort of a relatively slow process. So we're using an optimized version of that. And uh, so this is what we, are, we show here, how we can quickly get to a first round of uh, of uh, con consensus and you can collect all of these uh, signatures. Uh, so when you, when you have a two thirds uh, signatures, then you immediately go and you execute the transaction and you can start creating the next block immediately. So there's also an eager block production. So, so there's, there's continuously creating a block, uh, uh, being created blocks uh, when the transaction comes in. Uh, so if we fail, and it may fail, you may not reach these two thirds. And if you don't do that, then you have to do like the more time consuming full BFT style uh, reset of, of, the, of, the, uh, of the blockchain or not the entire blockchain, but that shard. So this is where the scalability come in and the sharding comes in. So if you have a reset on one shard, you, the, the other shards is uh, still running and you can uh, move uh, activities to, to the other shard. And the, the, the sharding is, is all about you know, that whenever there is congestion in the network, you, you add another shard, and, uh, which is basically addressing that, uh, that uh, bottleneck in, in the network, which is, uh, from a very practical point of view, uh, quite important. Because uh, if you can do that, 
you don't need to use a market to prioritize uh, or to address congestion in a network. So that's what happened today. If you go into to Ethereum, you have a congestion scenario. You, you go into what is called the mempool market, which is basically like a, a pricing of the transactions and you can add more, more fees and you can be prioritized and, and get executed in, in the network. So, so that makes it rather unpredictable what the actual price is for using an, an infrastructure, which is not a very good thing when you when you're running a business and you just want to you, you just want to know that you have a stable platform that has a stable fixed cost of uh, of uh, of use, and uh, and not that that is uncertain like uh, increasing cost uh, that just kicks in all of a sudden, not by you, not caused by you, but caused by a congestion in the system as, as a whole. So we're addressing that uh, with, the, uh, with the basic layer one. Uh, so the next thing is solved by the CK node. So this is the CK computation. There's a lot of stuff going into this. This is where all of these like decades of knowledge that we bring to, to, to this network goes in, number of different protocols, a number of different ways to orchestrate these uh, zero knowledge computation and, and multi-party computation in particular. The, the, one of the reasons is, uh, that we can make things run more efficient here is that we're bringing all these resources. We have all these nodes that can help run these, uh, uh, run stuff like uh, pre-processing. So they produce what is known as triples. So it's kind of fueling the, the computations and, uh, and it's kind of a, a, so the network as a whole is almost like a, uh, gas station with uh, with preprocessing material that is uh, moved to the uh, to the computation when when needed. So and and a number of other things that makes the the protocols uh, run fast and stable and robust. So this is a this is a very simplified story about the, one of the very basic uh, things that we bring to 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 blockchain. At the end of the day. You just meet a, a as a developer. You'll see a smart contract, and you'll say, "Okay, this I need to keep these input private. I need to run this type of computation on the private input." So it's, it's all hidden behind the the hood. All of this stuff. The last thing is the interoperability, and we are solving for that with a with a third type of node, which is the Oracle node. So this is a also a new innovation. And it's uh, using basically three different tools in order to, to create a uh, much more secure bridging than what we know about in, in the industry, at least. So the first thing is to establish a double bookkeeping. So it's all about moving information or values from one blockchain to, to another. And so, so a double bookkeeping is to establish that you have full transparency about what is happening on, on both of these uh, blockchain. So everyone can, and can assess if there is any imbalances between what is, what is being sent from Ethereum in this case and what's being received by the particular blockchain. The other thing is to, to make it run efficient. We, have, we do select a small group of nodes that is running the, the bridge for a certain time period. But that selection is done by, by the entire network. Uh, so, so, and by a, a large scale MPC, multi-party computation, multi-sig uh, solution that sign off and select the nodes. So the, this is bringing the, the trust up to the highest level in, in, in the blockchain, which is actually also done with the dog bookkeeping where the, where the, the, the entire network is mapping these information. And, and then the final piece is that the node that has been selected to run this bridge is, is putting using the stakes, using the NPC tokens as stakes to as an extra security for, for moving values uh, across the token bridge. And so they, every time value is moved, some of these stakes is locked in. And when there's no more stakes, the, the time period stops and you have a new group of nodes being selected to run the, the, the bridge. In the meantime, you can run disputes as now this is very transparent if there is imbalances. So it's very easy to go in and, and say, okay, there is an imbalance. I need, we need to solve this. You have all the stakes locked in there. So there is 
if there is any collusion, it's done by this uh, uh, the cluster of Oracle nodes, it's easy to, to have them uh, compensating for, for, for potential fraud. And by this making that very easy, the likelihood that this is happening is, uh, is very low. So, so that's, uh, that's how we create a bridging, which is bringing the security level up to the highest security level in a blockchain, which is the threshold, the two thirds of all node. All right. Uh, so, so that's uh, the three main types of role and uh, solving for the main types of, uh, of, uh, of properties, scalability, the privacy and the interoperability. We're, we're now at version three, uh, which is giving the full capacity of what you can do with the network. But there's a lot more coming, a lot more improvement, more protocols is coming in. So this is the roadmap for, for how we're going to improve the, the network for the, for the coming uh, years. So that is divided into uh, the different tasks, the basic blockchain here, the, uh, the privacy and the smart contract language and the uh, interoperability. Lots of work is coming in, lots of improvement, but today we have version three and it's have all the cap capabilities, so it's ready to use. And uh, we're really looking forward to this. So, so the way that we are helping you to, to get started with this is to, to build uh, components. So this is smart, smart contract that is solving bits and pieces of a, a full application. So you can go in, you can take these components, you can put them into your applications. So the idea here is that if we build strong components, you can go in and you can combine them. And uh, there will not just be a few applications, but there will be a ton of application uh, if you look at the combinations of these uh, components. Just to take one of these, uh, which I usually sort of emphasize, which is the CK Uniswap. So this is a DeFi, uh, this is a basic DeFi uh, market mechanism. It's, it's an automated market maker. The, uh, there's different version of these uh, swapping mechanism, but they're all about going into a single smart contract and going from one, one currency to another uh, with some liquidity pools. And the thing here is that you might have front running here. So you might have that the the very node operators who's running the network, they can see what you're doing with that service. So they can see if the price goes up or down and they could potentially try to front run your transaction and, and utilize that they have superior knowledge about this and control by running uh, nodes in the network. That's not very good for, for an infrastructure if, if, if you get to that point. So, and, and a way to completely remove that opportunity is to use this type of CK unit swap where you cannot see as a node operator whether the price is going up or going down. So you, you can just implement it or you can play on whether it goes up and goes down and, and that would we'd be, a, I guess, like anyone else in the economy. So, so, so an example of how a symbol not necessarily simple, but a component is addressing an existing problems out there. And that's what we are looking forward to see how you are going to combine this in, in ways that we never dreamed of. So with that, uh, we are to the next topic here, and maybe uh, should stop a little and uh, see if there are some questions. Let me see. Uh, for transparency, I'm very invested. Okay, so so sounds like uh, Uniswap. Would the offering partner of CK Swap uh, need to hold a stake? Uh, yes. So so that depends on who who's offering. Yes. So so if you are uh, so the question here is whether you'll uh, what does it take in terms of uh, staking? I guess for for running a CK Uniswap. So that is a, is a still smart contract run by a selected group of uh, Oracle nodes. So what what you do when you as a developer you go in there and you 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 select these uh, nodes. Or the system select them, and then you then you fuel the contract with with uh, with fees, and it's run. So so you are not going as a developer. You are not going to 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 stake these nodes. The node they have to stake. Otherwise, they will not be selected to run your computation. 
And even, and this is a kind of an interesting thing about the, the privacy. So here you select people to run on, on private information, but uh, the nodes they have and the network have no idea about the value of these private data. But you as a developer, you know that you're running an auction for very, very sort of in, in, in expensive commodities. So you know that, that you might need these nodes to stake even more, to have put more skin in the game to run your computation. And you can ask them to put more, put more stakes in there, more skin in the game to, to run your computation. There's another way so you can try to address some of these challenges there with serial node computation. All right, so, so how does uh, data audit work with CK proof uh, or CK? So it's not CK proof, it's CK computation. So uh, uh, CK computation is, is a general way to work with privacy preserving computation, but that's that's right. You, so you have private input data and, and, and uh, how, do, how do you do, how do you clean up these? How do you check these, the quality of these data? So, so uh, one thing is to, to, to work on it before, work on the quality before you submit it. The other thing is to, to run uh, checks on, on the data because whatever, whatever you can do, uh, automatic or algorithmic check of data, you can do that with, with MPC. But if you, can, uh, if you can clean it up before, it's, it's a lot easier. Uh, so, so, so that's also uh, depending on the application. Imagine an auction. An auction, I mean, this is, you don't need to clean up anything because there you build an incentive for people to submit bits. And if they do something wrong, I mean, they are just acting, uh, they're doing something foolish relative to the market mechanism and that may, may cause them to, to lose. But so, so they, are, they will have the, the incentive is sort of, in, uh, or the auction is incentivizing them to, to think hard about how, what kind of input they put into the, the system. So that's also a, another way to, to work with the quality of, of uh, data. But that's a, a general uh, ch challenge to, to work with uh, with data to ensure the quality. Uh, all right, uh, I think I'm actually spending a lot of time on this, so, so maybe I should uh, run a little bit faster on the, the pricing. On the other hand, uh, I mean, this is recorded and you can go back and, and, and listen to this again. So, so it's kind of important to, to see, also. so this is uh, the fees for running the system. So we have in here, we have some basic blockchain service and then we have some specialized CK computation services and we have some Oracle services. These are the three type of nodes. So we have some basic costs for, for basic services and network, CPU, storage, you know that from cloud computing, right? So it's kind of the thing that you want to buy from a computing network. Uh, so, so we have numbers in here, which is, uh, set by uh, simulations of the cost of running these uh, these nodes and and if you if you look at what what does that actually add up to so if you do a simple transaction this is uh, something like a us cent for for one uh, transaction then you can then there are some other fees for for running ck computation and then it becomes a little bit more difficult cuz to see how what does it cost cuz you really 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 need to know what you are computing so here's an example of a CLB auction with 20 participants. Uh, they're bidding, maybe it's a second price auction and, and that would add up to, to 2.5 US dollars in, in fees, uh, which is not a lot. I mean, we are talking about a network that is providing the same security that you can have, that you're using to, to run uh, the most valuable auction, high stake auctions in, in, in the world. And it usually costs millions to run these to be the trustee in these options. Here you can go in and get that power for two and a half US dollars. So it's, it's really a bit of a change uh, uh, and a very powerful uh, thing to do, yeah. And, and then you, you Oracle is about moving things using the bridge and there's a fee, uh, there's a lower fee for moving uh, B, into BYOC. There's a higher fee for, for moving across two external uh, networks. Anyway, uh, that's a fee uh, model. So we distinguish between two types. We distinguish between the basic blockchain services, the consensus, the propagation of data in the peer-to-peer -peer network, and then the specialized uh, CK jobs and the, and the bring your own uh, coin uh, or Oracle uh, token bridge uh, jobs. So the current payment for the basic blockchain fee 
is that every sort of what you call a block uh, epoch, a blockchain epoch, we after approximately 30 minutes, we aggregate all the fees and we distribute them equally among the eligible nodes. And, and here we are working with a model where the eligible nodes is uh, those, it's a sort of kind of a minimum number. So you need to be into a number of, of these signing off on the transaction, what is known as a proof of justification. So you need to be signing off on some of the transaction in order to, to get some of these uh, fees. So here we are setting a minimum number for, for how many transactions you need to sign off on in order to be part of the eligible nodes that receive uh, 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 payment. We're going to improve this. We all, uh, the improvement is, which we're actually already doing today, is that each of the nodes is bringing up public information about the local information happening in the peer-to-peer -peer network. And using that, we are, uh, we are, we are using that to, to delegate and uh, the, uh, the fees to the nodes. And all of this is about strengthening the entire network. It's about strengthening the network in terms of propagation, propagate data in the network. And it's about being connected. The more connected you are as a node and network, the more you, 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 you payment you receive. Right now, we have a very simple model and we are testing it. And uh, we, we think it's fair to do that because there's a, not, of course, we are the early stage, so there's not a lot of fees coming in. So we can play around with this model and get it right from the beginning uh, to get the best incentives. But when we have more money flowing through the network, we will have a stronger and stronger incentive to to improve the network and make it more and more efficient, uh, which is good for, for, for everyone. Then we have the uh, specialized function, the CK and the Oracle services. So this is where you select a smaller group of nodes uh, to run a job. So it could be a, this example, this segment like three nodes run a CK computation and it's, the fees are $90 and they distribute it equally. So this is also a model that we're going to, to improve on. You can have more nodes and, and you can have a improved selection of these nodes. So, so this is where you have uh, the whole trust scoring coming in that the more trusted you are, the higher probability you will have to be selected for these jobs. So, so this is where you can earn money more, or you can earn more uh, utility by, by uh, being more trusted in the network. And we're adding what we call jurisdiction management. So, so we have European nodes, US, American nodes, we have Asian nodes. We can divide it into different groups. In fact, we're dividing into all of the different countries. Uh, and, and, and the more nodes we have, the more uh, you have in each, uh, each country or in each jurisdiction. And, and you can select jurisdiction and have nodes in your, your jurisdiction running your computation. So, so that's um, also improved uh, uh, improvement. Uh, but it's all the foundation for all of this has been built in from in the blockchain from the beginning. And then we are sort of improving on, on these algorithms. And it's, as I mentioned a couple of times, it's really building on, on trust. So you are, as a node, you're, you're known to the network and you've built up your reputation and you're again going to be uh, valued by the network, by your reputation in, in the network. So, so this is uh, uh, what is hopefully going to drive this network to be a much stronger uh, or stronger and stronger the more it's used. All right. Uh, that uh, was another part of that was the pricing. I just want to take the, the other part here. So the, this is also, it's not about fees. It's, it's about the, the early phases of the network. It's about the bootstrapping. So, so what we have here, clearly the, the basic thing is the BYOC economy, which I've just spoke about the fees being paid for using the network. Uh, but in the beginning, we also have to, we have a bootstrapping process and that's the amazing thing you can do with a token economy. You can actually bootstrap these uh, two-sided markets. So that's what we're doing. We carved out like 10% of what is uh, of the total supply, half of the uh, ecosystem pool for, for bootstrapping the, the uh, the network, uh, the uh, uh, yeah, the node operation uh, of the network. So what we do is two steps. Uh, we have uh, a uh, delegated kind of, uh, or we have it. Uh, we're distributing all of these uh, ten percent into buckets. So this is a ten-year schedule. Schedule. 
so 40 markets, we have a allocation for each quarter, the next 10 years. And uh, since we have an unlock scheme, there's more and more tokens that is getting unlocked. And therefore you see that there's an increasing number, but there's also a decreasing in number as uh, we are rewarding the, the present more than the future. Since now we are in, in, the, uh, in the beginning of the network and uh, when more and more, trans and more and more application comes in, we have more and more fees and the BYOC, the basic BYOC economy is going to take over being the main uh, driver of the, of the network. So this is fading out the, uh, the bootstrapping process here. The second part of this is how we are going to distribute the uh, tokens that is allocated to each of these buckets. And that's where the incentives comes in again. So you have that, uh, these are some examples. So you have node operators, you have token holders, and everything here is delegating delegated tokens. So you delegate tokens to, to each of these nodes, and then you get rewarded relative to how many you delegate to each of the nodes. So, so what we're doing here is that we are measuring the unlocked token. So you have this un un unlocking scheme. Uh, so the, the important thing is to, to incentivize the, the unlocked uh, token. And that's what we are doing with this scheme and, and paying out people relative to the uh, number of tokens in that uh, period, in that bucket for, for, for that given quarter that this is happening. So in this case, we have a hundred tokens that can be distributed among uh, these, uh, yeah, in this case, only two token holders. So it's quite simple. Uh, we have a hundred unlocked tokens for the first one, and we have a uh, hundred for the other ones too. So they're actually getting split equal. We can have another scenario where you have more uh, delegation and then you change this uh, distribution. What we're also doing is that you're, we're adding the uh, performance of the nodes. So now the, the nodes, the more they perform, the more efficient they are, the more, uh, uh, the more rewards they get. So this is a way to incentivize the delegation towards the node operator, or in fact, maybe the other way around to make the uh, node uh, run as efficient as possible. So this is again, something that again, creating this collective good, which is the, that everyone, all the node is collaborating in, around making the network as strong as, as possible. So with that in place, uh, I should maybe uh, see if I can just jump. Uh, let me, there's some question about application. So I'm just going to, to sum up on, on uh, design choice and then we get to, to the actual use. So we actually already talked about the number of these. So I'm just going to emphasize that again. So that's it. There is a lot of, of uh, CK proof protocol and use out there. This is a simplified use of the first uh, baby step in towards zero knowledge computation. If you want to run real application like a matching service and stuff like that, you need to move a step further. This is the step further. This is a machine that can do any computation on private input. So that's important uh, differentiator. The other one is the decoupled token economy facilitate collaboration uh, that you bring in extra, external coin and you can work with them in, in the particular blockchain and network, opening, opening up a lot of opportunities. Uh, there is the arbitrary private public coordination. The thing that we have, uh, you have two networks, you have a public and a private network. So you go in, you have an application sitting and uh, solving a certain job in a given jurisdiction, you're facing certain regulation for in that in that region. You can address that with the, the with this arbitrary use of public and private uh, uh, coordination of information. Then we can go in and solve all of these big classes of problems like advertisement or matching service. And I'll get back to this uh, in a minute. Uh, the other thing is the scalable, rapid execution and finalization and all that stuff. Uh, uh, I will not dive into this, but uh, we are deliberately not doing CK rollup because it will slow down the whole thing and you will need the full ledger anyway. And this is kind of a waste of energy to try to go that way. But we are doing, uh, of course, we're using CK proofs, part of the toolbox, and then we can use that for very data intensive uh, applications and you bring down a, a proof of, of what is happening. So there's a number of ways that you use these tools, uh, but not for, for CK rollup. That's an unnecessary step to take. Uh, 
the design of the uh, collaborative, the the uh, the uh, delivering privacy and bring in uh, bringing external coins is very important for the network. We are it's facilitating exactly the the go to market uh, model and the whole business model for for the network. And if you look at other network, uh, we are competitive in terms of scalability and finalization, rapid finalization. We can scale up, keep the same prices, and, uh, independent of, of uh, the work coming into the network. We have the privacy uh, built in. We have the interoperability. So with that, uh, we're ready to talk about what can you actually use this for. So, so that was a long and a, a uh, warned you in the beginning, it would be a long talk and sorry for that, but this is kind of the number of things that we have in this network. And it's sort of important, I think, to understand that in order to see what are the opportunities, what is it that you can do on this network that you cannot do on other networks. Now I'm talk about some of the applications that we are, we are solving for here. Um, I see some of the questions also about the, uh, the skill set and so on. And, uh, Tomorrow, there will be uh, Jesper Rauko and Peter Fransen, they will come and they will be uh, talking about what, what, uh, what kind of, how do you actually do this in practice? Uh, uh, how do you work with, uh, with the smart contract language, uh, uh, which is Rust in, in, in this case? Uh, we'll get back to that uh, tomorrow. Uh, but let me talk about some of the applications here, some of the opportunities that opens up when you have this uh, type of network. I think this is a good example. So here we have a uh, one of the first projects that we worked on, which is a decentralized uh, data exchange. So here the users are in control of the data. They now don't have to sell the data. They can actually just sell the use of the data, and, and thereby they can they can uh, uh, get paid back for 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 that, and they can keep selling the data basically. Uh, uh, forever. So we have really a good example here where the users uh, are in control and getting empowered by the network. This is another example of one of the earliest projects that we were doing, which is a uh, order financial order matching service. So this is kind of an institution that is trading the most values in, in, in the world, in fact. So this is where the largest players in the economy, they go and trade uh, large positions of stocks and, and other assets. And they do that by, by sort of an automated uh, matching of these bits and ask. And then they bring in uh, prices from the established uh, exchanges and they, they do a, uh, a settlement based on, on, on these uh, matching. We built a, a matching service for this uh, using MPC. So, the thing with these institutions is that they have also been a honeypot for, for hackers because this is kind of where you have a lot of information and you can, if you can get that, you, you can also make money in the financial market. So, so the idea was to, to, to make this a stronger solution uh, by, by using a MPC or via a distributed system. So, so that's what the, uh, the financial order matching is uh, solving for. So another one of the uh, one of the early projects that we did was with uh, and one of the one of the our go to to market uh, sort of uh, strategies is to to uh, work on flagship and this is one of the flagship we worked with the, the global fund and the red.org uh, on on using NFT to fundraise fundraise for for uh, for COVID uh, vaccination in this case. So uh, that's another, and we are building, of course, the, the M, uh, NFT capability into the network. So you can come in, you can build these type of services. So what we're doing here is that you start out with an NFT, a piece of art in this case, it could be, any, it could be many other things. It's a piece of art and you raise funding, it goes to you to the good course, and uh, you can actually sell this uh, piece of art again, and then you can keep raising funding for, for that good course. And that's really the, the trigger, what made uh, it interesting for, for an organization like the Global Fund. And uh, we did actually raise uh, almost uh, 450,000 for, for, for this and helped uh, 80,000 people getting a COVID vaccination uh, using this type of fundraising. It works. And another solution I think is very interesting is that uh, in this case, we're actually creating a stable coin. We're creating a stablecoin that is used to support 
the purchasing of medicine in uh, third world countries, in developing countries. And, uh, and when we do that, we attract the, all the traits around this. And we also uh, enables us to do uh, uh, forensics. We can do, we can check whether the medicine that is sold is actually counterfeit or not, which is a big, big problem. So, so 70% of all uh, medicine is counterfeit in, in, in African region. Uh, and uh, this can be addressed by, by this solution. Uh, and we, in order to solve that, you need to bring in a lot of data from, uh, from the supply chain, you need to bring in private data from pharma companies and others in order to, to improve the forensic and, and capturing the counterfeit medicine. So that we're solving, that's where the privacy comes in. Interesting solution. Another one is uh, pointing back to the capability to, to mapping things. So here the idea, and this is collaboration with the Cyber Peace Institute in order to improve uh, people to be to address uh, incoming uh, IOC uh, or, or C, uh, what is it called, compromises of, uh, in, indicators of compromises, sorry, indicate, IOC indicators of compromises in the, uh, in the cyber, in, in cyber crime. So this is the type of uh, cyber breach that is well known, it's categorized, it's something that you can describe, you can share that in a network. Uh, so the thing is that this is not something that is done today because you kind of show your vulnerability if you just say, okay, you, you just publicly tell that I'm, I'm now hit by this uh, IOC and, uh, and stuff. You should have shown that you are in a vulnerable position and uh, it might even impact your reputation as an organization. So what we're doing here is to facilitate and network using this technology to confidentially share intelligence that is shared among a number of a group of uh, NGOs in this case. So they now immediately when they are hit by an IOC, they can share that and everyone knows what is coming and people can be prepared for this. So it's, a, it's a, a, a pointing at a generic type of solution that is mapping uh, activities and network and helping uh, people to, to, to uh, address whether that is fraud detection, whether that is uh, cyber peace, uh, cyber security breaches or whatever it is. Another strong solution. This is a self sovereign identity, which is a, a start, sort of a starting point for, for many applications and, and something that we're going to evolve stepwise uh, a, a, along the way. So we started out with this as a COVID passport. So here it's a very sort of lightweight solution. So it should, we work, it should be working in, in an African context and we're working with uh, global NGOs uh, on this. So we have the doctors taking a photo of the, uh, of the patient, giving the vaccination, registering that and then representing that information on, on the blockchain. So when you get to this prove and verifier situation, you need to prove that you have your uh, COVID vaccination. You, the, uh, the verifier get a picture of the person in front of him on his phone, and he can do the authentication, identification simply by comparing the picture of the person in front of him. No personal information or anything. Then there's a check mark saying, okay, the person actually do have the COVID vaccination. Then you're done. No, no, no private information is shared because you already look at looking at the person. So there's no nothing shared here, uh, and it's still solving the problem. We're building on this and and extending this. So you can imagine that you get more and more private data sitting there in in a in a in a in a, in a private data uh, container controlled by the individuals. And then you can come in in certain situation, you can ask that data and you can do that uh, without revealing anything. So you do the zero knowledge proof or, zero, or MPC computation on the data and you can see whether you are, you are above aging, whether you are eligible to go into this and that shop or whatever it is that you need to, to check for. And you can do it without uh, revealing uh, privacy. So it's kind of a very sort of basic uh, component that we're going to improve on moving forward. Uh, this one is head on to the biggest uh, driver of the internet economy, the advertisement industry. So here we are using the technology to take the private information. So a bit like before, you have some private information that you are in a advertisement context, you replace your private information with a persona that fit the context 
that persona is now sent to the auction market where advertisers are bidding for showing uh, who should show the advertisement to you and the winner get to show that advertisement. It generates values. It happens all the time, every split second uh, around the globe. But now you're in control. Now you're part of this value chain and part of a fair share of this is going back to you as a user. Very powerful way to change the, the current uh, data economy. This one, I think this is the last one. Uh, I know it's taking more time than expected, but this is a, a project that we are working on with the International Committee of Red Cross. So we are building now a stable coin so in, and replacing what is known as the cash in voucher system, where you go into a country, you de delegate uh, cash, real cash, to in, give them in the hands of a list of 1,000 people that has been appointed beforehand. Uh, so, so that is a delegate process. Uh, so here we are creating a cryptographic solution to doing that. And we are building in privacy. So you are the anonymous, so the recipient, they are anonymous. So no one else in that economy can see that now you're getting money because it's kind of important because you're in a vulnerable situation. It might be a war zone uh, and you also have private uh, transactions. So there's a lot of privacy used to solve this problem in, in a much better way. And giving money to in the hands of the people that need it that is the absolute most efficient way to, to help uh, people in a crisis zone. Not sending in uh, commodities, give them money because that will strengthen the economy and, and, and they can all uh, Im improve. Uh, but you need to, to do that in a way that is uh, non-corruptible. And that's exactly what we're doing here. Okay, Kurt, do you want to answer some more questions that are in the Q&A? Matching and network assessment is the two most important things here. So I'm out of time. Uh, so uh, let, me, let me stop here and uh, see what kind of uh, questions we have here. Okay, Kurt, if you scroll a little bit up in the Q&A section, mm -hmm. there was one interesting question from uh, anonymous attendee, uh, he she asked, "What do you think about nil message computation that apparently claims to be a revolutionary leap from the secure multi-party computation?" Yes, so, so uh, I, I, I don't know this in detail the protocols, but I, I haven't seen any sort of uh, uh, peer-reviewed uh, work on this. Uh, it, it to me, it looks like a very simple form for uh, MPC that only have one round of communication, which makes it, of course, make it run faster, but it also makes it uh, uh, less generic. So uh, I don't I don't see anything uh, new in this. Uh, honestly, uh, this is uh, what what we are doing. This is not a new type of MPC. It's a, a, sp a special type of MPC that is simplified to a single round. Uh, so you can, of course, you can adjust sort of the security models underneath and do things. So, so this is what uh, this uh, group of people behind the particular blockchain has been doing for, 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 for decades, working on, on developing protocols like this. Uh, no, I don't think that is uh, anything new. All right. And then a Vibe Hub has a question. Is his app token independent of other activities on chain? Independent of other activity on chain, uh, is my app token independent of other activity on chain? And uh, no, uh, things like uh, gas leaks. Uh, ah, okay, okay, yes, yes, okay. I think I, I get it. So, so no, it, it's it's it is not in the basic sense that you, we have these fixed prices for 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 what it costs to use the network, and we have the scalability building. So if, if there is a bottleneck which could otherwise trick a increasing price. You could, uh, uh, you basically address that by, by increasing the uh, capability of the network and keeping the fixed price. Mm -hmm. So no. Uh, actually, that was exactly what was the question was all about, but I think this is the, the answer. Uh, uh, let me see. Uh, Uniswap, yeah, that was again, uh, Uniswap, yes, perfect. Uh, we talked about that. Uh, uh, da, 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 da. All right, do you see any other? I see that Robert asked, will dApps be able to decide which new nodes they use 
for example, deciding the only nodes with 100K, 500K, 1 million NBC token staked are illegal. Yes. Uh, so we are going to, to uh, right now, there is like a threshold. You have to have a certain number of tokens staked. And uh, as a user, you come in and you can set uh, increase that requirement to ask for more stakes. Maybe because you are running some very sensitive computation. You can also go in and are and, and, oh, soon to be, you can go in and select jurisdiction. Uh, and moving forward, we can we will improve on this. So there yeah, would be more sort of user uh, preferences coming into the selection of, of the nodes. Uh, but you already now can set some, uh, increase the threshold for, for how many uh, stakes is required for, for running your, your computation. Uh, so, and, and another thing is that is important is also to, uh, to have the network, which is a lot of things is, is, is moving towards that, improving the network, improving uh, or, or rewarding the most trusted nodes. That's not necessarily the uh, node or with the most token, but I think it will be because they with the delegated token, you have that you can delegate tokens into a, a node and make it more powerful. And uh, that node can, can participate in, in, in more jobs. So here you have uh, a, a different type of incentive as proof of stake. It's not the, uh, the, most, uh, the one with the most stakes, the most riches that is getting the most power. It's actually most trusted that is getting the most power. And that's a very sort of basic proposition for, for the network, uh, which is, I think, a lot more head on to what you try to solve with the infrastructure. So yes, uh, I mean, the answer was basically yes, uh, but more is coming. Uh, can we run machine learning models uh, via MPC? You can. Uh, clearly, when, when you have MPC, there is a, a uh, uh, overhead on the computation. It do cost some extra to run these computations. It's uh, relatively complicated types of computation. But you can run uh, MPC uh, or machine learning. So uh, if, especially if you, if you already have a trained model, you can you, you can use that in uh, in a secure environment uh, uh, without a problem. The 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 uh, expensive part is to train the model, uh, and that's uh, that's where you might meet the uh, some of the bottlenecks in the system. But then I think the first step, uh, the one that we're focusing on, is to utilize uh, federated machine learning, where you use the combination of federated machine learning and MPC to uh, to uh, to train model to Im improve uh, uh, machine learning and, and that actually works for if you go to uh, that level of details both for data that is uh, split horizontal meaning that you have uh, the same variables sitting on on the local uh, computers or uh, vertical split data where you have different uh, data sitting on different nodes. You will need uh, MPC to an increasing extent in order to do a federated machine learning. So uh, there are definitely uh, ways uh, to, to use uh, machine learning with MPC. I think that was uh, oh, the last one. Uh, question do you want to say? Yes. Yes. So, uh, so uh, yes. So we uh, uh, right now it's it's used to as a uh, the BYOC is used to pay pay the, the node operators uh, uh, only. Uh, so uh, there will be more opportunities in, in the in the future. Uh, are there any other questions here? Uh, I think that was about it. So uh, I think with this I will uh, conclude the presentation for today, and. Uh, Remember to invite you all for, for tomorrow. It's going to be a lot more hands-on, I believe, uh, that where Jesper and, and, and Peter is going to talk about how you actually use the network in, in practice. So uh, thank you for, for showing up and uh, thank you. Thank you, Kurt. And thank you everybody who was here present listening. Uh, one of the questions was also about the recording. And I assure you guys, you will have the recording, just not in 10 minutes. <laughs>
a little bit uh, more of time we need uh, to upload it, but you will be able to see it in Patizia blockchain hackathon page. And I can drop the link here as well. So make sure that you are checking time by time the hackathon that Patizia uh, page. So all of the info is there. And also Patizia has Discord channel, Telegram channel. So all your interests and questions can be also answered outside of the webinar in these social media channels. I just posted in the chat section, the link for the hackathon page. So there, if you scroll down, you can see the list where the recordings will be published for yesterday's webinar, for today's webinar, and for the coming ones. Okay. Thank you, Kurt, for your time. It was very interesting also for me to listen. And thank you, everybody, for coming. That's it. Thank you.